OK, as you can see, I need to make it bigger. But um, uh, the exam is over on the left. That is the practice exam is over on the left and scratch papers on the right should I need it. But I'm going to scroll through this real quickly. Uh, the practice exam starts out with, um, OK, you're going to be simplifying radicals, square roots in particular, and then you're going to square um, a sort of a binomial. I guess we could call it a radical binomial. Uh, then square both sides of an equation of, of a radical equation, that is solve a radical equation. Use the Pythagorean theorem to solve um, a triangle, a right triangle problem. Uh, transformations and one-to-oneness. See, um, function one to one and inverse. So you're going to be finding the inverses. You're going to be playing around a little bit with complex numbers. Everything we've been studying since the last test. Um, solve quadratic equations, but this time you're using uh, the quadratic formula should you need to. Um, OK, you're analyzing quadratic functions. That is finding the vertex. And a couple of word problems that have to do with finding the vertex. Um, let's see, zeros of functions and how they relate to uh, x-intercepts. What are zeros of functions? Um, intervals of increase and decrease, local maxima and minima. Um, analyzing um, a polynomial, that is, what is the leading term, what's the leading coefficient, blah, 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 blah. End behavior, uh, the importance of the leading term. Uh, find a polynomial of lowest degree with only real coefficients having, okay, and you are going to uh, actually build polynomials from the zeros. And so there are a measly 30 problems on the practice exam, and I believe there are 20 problems. I don't really remember. I think there are 20 problems on the exam. There might be 25, but I really tried to reduce the, pro the uh, number. So with any luck at all, it's down to 20. So now, go ahead and put some questions on me. I am here to be the answer lady. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. I'll be here tomorrow playing the answer lady again. And then Wednesday we go back to work. Can you do number three? Yes, Please. yes, I would be glad to do number three. Number three, parentheses, six plus the square root of 10 squared is going to equal 6 plus the square root of 10 times 6 plus the square root of 10. And then we'll multiply. Are we just reviewing today, Professor? We're just going over the uh, practice final exam, yes. So I'm being the answer lady. Uh, would it be okay if I 
uh, go take the practice exam and leave class? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Good luck on the practice exam. OK, six times six is thirty six. Six times the square root of ten, that is six times plus the square root of ten is plus six times the square root of ten. And the square root of ten plus the square root of ten times six is another plus six times the square root of ten. And then plus the square root of 10 times plus the square root of 10 is plus the square root of 10 squared, which of course will be 10, right? So this is 10. We'll have 36 plus if I have six square roots of 10 and I add another six square roots of 10, I will have 12 square roots of 10. And so I combine the two like terms, that gives me 46 plus 12 times the square root of 10. Was that clear or clear as mud? I hope it was clear as clear water. There. Okay, so th let's write that, write the answer. Forty six plus twelve times the square root of ten, just so we know we did it. Good. Now I am sure somebody has some more questions. How about number four? Sorry. Okay, sounds good. Number four. X minus three equals the square root of X minus one. OK. OK, we square both sides, right? Um, first, I have to make sure that one radical is is isolated. It's all by itself on either the left or on the right of the equal sign. So we have that made here. We have that fulfilled, that contingency fulfilled. Now I'm going to square both sides. OK, so I'm going to do that. When I square a square root, I just get what's underneath, so it comes out. And over here, we're going to have X squared minus 3x minus 3x 
plus 9 equals x minus 1. And that'll be x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals x minus 1. Now, this is a quadratic equation, so I am going to pull everything over to where the x squared is positive because it's easier that way than moving everything over to the other side. Oh. Okay. So minus x minus x plus one plus one. That'll give me zero plus zero, which is zero over there. And over on the left side, we will have x squared minus seven x plus 10. Okay, positive 10 factors into negative two times negative five. And the reason I went with the negative factors is they have to add up to a negative factor. So let's see, negative two plus negative five equal negative seven. And so that's what I want. So boom, 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 boom equals zero. X and X and minus two and minus five. There I have the factorization. And then I set each factor equal to zero. And then I solve each of these equations. I add two to both sides. I have x equals two. I add five to both sides. I have x equals five. And if this were a regular equation, I would just say that my two answers are two and five, but the fact that I have a radical equation means that I have to check both of my answers. So, x minus three equals the square root of x minus one. x equals two. x equals five. Um, so I'm going to check both answers. For x equals 2, I'll have 2 minus 3 equals the square root of 2 minus 1. So negative 1 equals the square root of 1. The square root of 1 is positive 1. So negative 1 does not equal positive 1. This is a false statement. So this says that x equals 2 cannot be one of my solutions. That doesn't mean that x equals 5 automatically is. I have to check it and make sure. Uh, 5 minus 3 equals the square root of 5 <clears throat> minus 1. 5 minus 3 is 2. 5 minus 1 is 4, so we have the square root of 4, which is 2. So we'll have 2 equals 2, which is true. And so we have one answer to put in the answer box. And that is 5. Not 2 comma 5, but just 5. In fact, if you put both answers in here, 
my math lab will count it wrong. I will give partial credit, but you want to go for the gold. So put it, go ahead, check both your answers and, <clears throat> and put those answers in. It's not like you have a time limit. Um, I don't have time limits on my exams. So you could presumably take all day. I hope not. Your brain would get really tired. Anyway, one answer. And there we go. I'm going to save this. I guess I'm not. Never mind. I'll wait. Okay. Next question, y'all. Put a nice little Southern touch in there. Scroll through here again, give you some ideas. What do you know that you have trouble with that you miss every time? Get the working on inverse. Got it. I just know I always miss a couple steps in there. It kind of confuses me. Well, good. Let us definitely do that. Gotta find it. <laughs> now you know and I know, I definitely All right, solving, no. One-to-one, one. there we go. There's a one-to-one. One. Let's do that. All right, so number 10. F of X equals one fourth times x to the third minus six. And they're already telling you for the one to one function. So they're telling you it's one to one. Don't spend time worrying about that. What they want is the inverse. So here are the steps. Change f of x to y so that it, you know, you're keeping it simple. y equals one fourth x to the third minus six. And then I'll even number these. Then you do the truly radical step. It's not radical, that's the wrong word to use, but it, it's kind of earth shaking. You switch the x and the y. I was never comfortable doing that. Then number three, so I'm going to actually skip, skip some area. So that I can begin solving for Y. Sometimes this is a real short, easy step. Sometimes it's a really difficult step. But you have to solve for Y. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to add 6 to both sides of the equation. So there I've added 6 to both sides of the equation, which zeroes the, the minus 6 out. So I'll have x plus 6 equals one fourth times y to the third. Okay, now I have to get rid of the fraction. 
the fraction is not in parentheses with y. So it's a it's like an independent contractor. You got to get rid of that first. So multiply both sides by the denominator. All right, so you'll have 4x plus 24 equals, the fours cancel, that's why I did it. So I'm left with y to the third. Then to solve for y, I have to do the opposite, not the opposite, the inverse operation of y to the third, which is the cube root of y. So I'm going to take the cube root of y to the third and the cube root of 4x plus 24. And that's one thing. So you can't say, well, maybe I should take apart 24 and find out if it has a cube root. No. This is one thing, 4x plus 24, so don't do that. All right, the cube root of y to the third is y, but how you can prove it to yourself is this. This three on top, that three on the bottom. Since three over three is one, or cancels out, that leaves you with just plain y. So y equals the cube root now, um, my math lab might leave the answer like this for parentheses x plus 6, or might have it like this, doesn't matter, they're both correct. And so when you get to the answer box, you see this, you see this. And you're going to type the cube root of 4x plus 24. So, okay, so this is step four. I made up the steps, so I don't remember sometimes if I make it four or five. So this is going to be your answer, the cube root of 4x plus 24. Now, you can graph these or not, uh, but the domain of any polynomial, this is just a polynomial, is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range of any cubic is negative infinity to positive infinity. So you reverse those for F inverse, but it's still negative infinity to positive infinity. And then you want to choose the graph. Choose the graph. Well, this could be easy or hard, but I can tell you right away it's not A because this is, this is a fraction, the graph of a fraction, a rational function, so we can get rid of that. And now, all we have to do is check this out. So we could do, you know, Y equals X to the third looks like that. Now, y equals one fourth x to the third would be a little flatter. And then minus six would move it down six units. So that the blue one, the blue one is the uh, the basic graph or oh, yeah, 
not the basic graph, is the, the original f of x. f inverse of x, well, first, this is the only blue one that's correct. So that leaves these out, and you could choose that. However, you could also graph both of them on your graphing calculator and see which one matches these, which graph matches these. Either way. Okay, we can even go for another one. How about this? Is this one to one? You don't even have to know anything about it. Just do the horizontal line test. Excuse me. That's right. These are on different programs. All right, horizontal line test coming up. That horizontal line crosses this graph at only one point. So this is one-to-one. -one. Just for future reference, this is an exponential function. All exponential functions are one-to-one. -one. Did that help? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Good. Yes. Was, was someone trying to ask a question? It was very staticky where I am. It was more of a reply, but um, Next one, maybe be two one p nine. I'm sorry. I I heard you say one fifty nine. I bet you didn't say that. I believe she asked for twenty nine. <laughs> ah, thank you. Yeah, that's not easy. Let's do it. Get a whole new piece of paper for this one. Number 29. Go back to black. All right. You have three zeros here. Zero one is three plus the square root of six. Zero two is three minus the square root of six. And zero three is five. And we're asking, <clears throat> they're asking, find the polynomial of lowest degree with real coefficients and having these zeros. Okay, the, they should have said rational, but I know what they meant. The reason I say that is we're dealing with square roots here. So anyway, these are conjugates. When you've got real rational coefficients to the x's, um, every radical function has to include or has to accompany its conjugate. Um, just telling you that. So anyway, Oh, 
okay, this is the tool, if you like, that you use to create a, to build a polynomial from its zeros. All right, we're assuming that A is one, unless you're told otherwise. So f of x is going to equal, um, now I'm going to use brackets here and you're going to see why. So that's what we've got right now. Obviously this, these two, are the naughty children that are gonna cause us trouble. So just get used to that idea right now. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is distribute the minus sign. So I can get rid of these inner parentheses. X minus three minus the square root of six. Now I'm keeping my brackets for a reason that will become apparent in a few minutes. Times X minus three plus the square root of six times x minus five. Now, now I'm about to do something. Okay, notice for a minute, please that x minus three matches x minus three. It's my favorite color. And the square root of six matches the square root of six. That's why I'm doing this. So these two uh, factors are exactly the same except for the sign in the middle. So th these match, these match, but just the signs in the middle are different. That makes them conjugates. Of course, we already knew they were conjugates, but this makes them conjugates. Even the X is involved with the conjugates. So I think I did this Thursday. Is this Monday? It is, isn't it? I think I did this Thursday in class, uh, a similar problem, not this problem. But what I'm gonna do is this. I'm going to let X minus three equal A and the square root of six equal B so that I have A and B and A and B and then a minus here and a plus here. And now I'm going to multiply them. So I'll get A squared plus AB minus AB, that would be minus B times A, but B times A and A times B are the same thing, minus B squared. And then we have AB minus AB, well that's zero. They, when, whenever you subtract the same thing from itself, you get zero. 
So you'll have a squared minus b squared. Now what that means for us is that since a is x minus 3, minus, and b is the square root of 6, and a and b are both squared, I can do this, and that has saved me a step. or made it easier if you want to use the A and B method. But if you also want to memorize that conjugates will always do this, that can really save you time. Okay, now before I lose my poor little X minus five here, let's bring it back into the game. Don't want to lose anything. Now I'm going to square this and square that. So I'm going to scroll up. And I will have X minus three times x minus 3 minus the square root of 6 squared is 6 times x minus 5. I promise we will use x minus 5 eventually. Just got to get the harder stuff out of the way first. Now, this is going to give us x squared minus 3, x minus 3, x plus 9 minus 6 times x minus 5. So we're going to have x squared minus 6x plus 9 minus 6 is plus 3 times x minus 5. So we're not done yet. Okay, now scroll up. It's easier for me to write, and I think it's easier for you to see. So we're going to do this. I'm going to take each term of this front polynomial and multiply it by the x minus 5, the binomial. Okay, so I'm going to have x squared minus 6x plus three, I don't need that much room, I know, but still, times x minus five, times x minus five, times x minus five. We're almost done. F of x equals x squared times x is x to the third, x squared times minus 5 is minus 5 x squared. Minus 6x times x is minus 6x squared. And minus 6x times minus 5 is plus 30x. And plus 3 times x is plus 3x. And plus 3 times minus 5 is minus 15. Whew, one more step. Got to clean it up. Combine your like terms together. x to the third minus 5x squared minus 6x squared is minus 11x squared. 
and 30x plus 3x is plus 33x, and then minus 15. And this is one of the polynomial one of the polynomials you get from these three zeros. You can change the polynomials by changing the a. If a were two, if a were three, if a were four, if a were five, and so on and so forth. But here is our basic polynomial right here that um, that you get from these three zeros. So let me scroll down a little bit there. This is what we did. Well, that helped a lot. Good, good. So. More questions. Let me mention this. In number 30, now we talked about this on Thursday too, but I just want to remind you that when they say, when the instructions say, the people who wrote the book say, rational coefficients or real coefficients, Rationals are real, so they go together. Then normal numbers, I mean, what we would call normal numbers, they're rational numbers, like one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three, zero, um, two thirds, negative five eighths, point twenty five, numbers like that. They don't combine with with other numbers. They don't necessitate other numbers, but complex numbers and um, irrational numbers do require conjugates. And so that's what they're asking about here. All, you, you don't have to do what you did up here. What, what we did over here, where we had to find a whole new uh, polynomial. You're not going to have to do that on these problems. These are really short. All they tell you over here is that, okay, there is a polynomial of degree four with rational coefficients that have the given zeros. Find the other zeros. Okay, well, negative i is your first zero here. And negative, oh, no, it's not. It's two minus the square root of five. That's an irrational number. Notice it also has two parts, just like um, complex numbers do. So, you know, even though it's a real number, it's got that. Sometimes you just can't get away from it. But anyway, these, this is a complex number. This is a, a real number, but an irrational number. Both of these require, must be accompanied by their conjugates. So let's figure out what the conjugates are. If I put negative i into complex form, a plus bi form, then I'll have zero minus i. So the conjugate is zero plus 
I. Which would be right. However, since they write it as negative I, you can just let this equal zero plus I is just I. Now over here, you have the same thing. The conjugate of two minus the square root of five is two plus the square root of five. So these are going to be your other zeros. And that's what you're going to write in here. You're just going to write I comma, two plus the square root of five. Okay, that can mess you up considering that you're just coming from where problems where you had to actually build, or one problem where you had to actually build a polynomial. Um, I mean, I have messed that up before by not carefully reading the instructions. Um, and I've gone ahead and I've actually built a polynomial, which was not fun or easy. However, this is all they were asking for. So be careful to save yourself work if you can. Oh. Okay. Normally I would have put a, a bunch of these and a bunch of these and um, a bunch of these and, but we were already pushing 30. Remembering that this is ir uh, irrational. This is intermediate algebra and college algebra put together. You have problems from both classes. So that cuts down on the repetition. Okay, good, more questions, more questions. Talk to me, talk to me. I'll drink some coffee. and save my document while I'm at it. <clears throat> Can you scroll up? Yeah, sure. Seventeen, maybe. Sorry. Seventeen. Seventeen. I think this one. I give it a minute. My computer froze. Oh dear. This is one number. Seventeen is about find the vertex and determine whether there's a a maximum or a minimum value and find the value and find the range. Find the intervals of increase and decrease. Sure, we'll do that one. All right, sounds good. Okay, so we're looking at, well, I think I might be able to do it on here. We're being asked for the vertex. Once you have the vertex, you easily have, Hold my breath for a minute, hiccups. Um, once you have the vertex, you have the answer to all the other problems. So that's why if 
finding the vertex first is such a handy thing. Okay, so we're going to find the vertex. Here you have um, a function in which A is 2 and B is negative 16. So negative B over 2A is going to be negative negative 16 over 2 times 2 equals positive 16 over 4 equals 4. Now that's the x coordinate of the vertex. I still have to find the uh, y coordinate which is going to be 2 times 4 squared minus 16 times 4 plus 33. And I am going to grab my calculator for that. Um, where was I? There. Okay. So let me make sure this is right. All right. So two, since four is a, a positive number, I don't have to put it in parentheses, though I admit it's a habit for me. Two times four squared minus 16 times four plus 33. I get one. You might want to double check me and make sure you get one. Call that crowdsourcing. Crowd solving. Okay, well, I get for a vertex for one. And something you have to determine early is, is it cupped up or cupped down? Well, with a positive leading term there, this baby is cupped up. And there's your vertex right there. Four, one. Okay, B, determine whether the parabola has a maximum or a minimum value. Well, this is at the bottom. The vertex is at the bottom of the graph. So it's a minimum point. And when you have a minimum point, you have a minimum value. And the minimum value is always the Y value K, which is one. All right, so the parabola opens upward and the minimum value and has a minimum value of one. Ah! All right, now what's the range? You don't often get asked that, but the range, let me draw this again. If, if your y-axis were over here, And if that was your x-axis, then this would be your lowest y value. And from there, the parabola goes up forever. So when you have a cupped up parabola, your range is going to be bracket k comma infinity parenthesis. Here, k is 1. 
So, I mean, you wouldn't actually write that. These are just instructions for you. This is going to be bracket one comma positive infinity close parentheses. Now, on what interval is the function increasing? Well, it's going up here. So it would certainly be reasonable to expect that the K number to infinity would be the range. And it is. Uh, that's the range, yes. One to infinity. It's the range, but, but, but. All right, so let's say the mistake. Wrong. Here's the wrong answer. One to infinity. Or let's say you remember you're never supposed to use brackets, so instead you use a parenthesis and you go home, like I did a few times when I was a student, completely certain I was right, only to find out I was horribly, horribly wrong when I got my paper back. There were no computers at the time. Well, there were, but not that I had access to. So this is wrong. What is correct? The correct answer is what is the interval on the x-axis? Now this is four and one. So the interval of increase is on the x-axis. The correct answer is from the x-coordinate of the vertex to the right forever. Remembering that is a bear. I found it that way anyway. Same thing for decrease. Scroll up. Here we've got 4, 1. That is, this is 4, 1. This is 4 on the x-axis. Here you've got the graph going down, 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 decreasing. And so on the x-axis from negative infinity to four, the graph is decreasing. So this is from negative infinity to four. It doesn't feel right. I should get red, right? Red. Big old red X. <laughs> Believe me, I've had plenty of red X's in my life. You don't get out of math without a red X or two. Although a lot of teachers use pink now. Because it's not red and people have bad associations with red. I also discovered people don't pay attention if you don't use red. That's why I went back to red. When possible. OK, more questions. 16. 16. Yeah, this problem, I'll tell you, it was on the final last semester. Now that doesn't mean it will be this semester. That was one of the problems given by the math department, and I never know ahead of time, more than a week ahead of time, what their problems are going to be. 
Maybe we'll know two weeks ahead of time. There is talk about letting everybody know two weeks ahead of time. That would be nice. I agree. All right. Anyway, here we go. Oh, OK. All right, you have 3x squared minus 7x equals 1. Quadratic equation, you've got to pull that 1 over. So 3x squared minus 7x minus 1 equals 1 minus 1, which is 0. Now, I would love to factor this. Um, if I do it by grouping, I would have, or the AC method, I would say three times negative one is negative three, and there are no factors of negative three that add up to negative seven. So I have to use the quadratic formula. X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 ah, ac all over 2a and pull that fraction bar right out there to where the negative b is don't just keep it under there pull it out or your answer will be wrong and i don't want that all right, so I have to figure out what A, B, and C are. A is 3, B is negative 7, C is negative 1, and so X is going to equal negative, negative 7, plus or minus the square root of negative 7 squared minus 4 times three, times negative one, all over two times three. Okay, now, that's gonna be a plus seven. Anytime you square a negative number, you get a positive number. Now, if you don't have parentheses around negative 7, when you put it in the calculator, you're going to get negative 49, and that's wrong. Let me prove it to you right now. Negative 49 squared. Enter. Negative 2401. But the correct answer is parentheses negative 49, parentheses closed squared, enter. The correct answer is positive 2401. So you have to be very, 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 very careful. Now, as it is, that's negative seven. Yes, I just noticed that, but the same principle applies. That's what happens when your brain works faster than your mouth or your hand. It can be annoying. OK. Negative 7 times negative 7 is positive 49. Minus negative 12 times negative 1 is plus 12. All over 6. So x equals 7 plus or minus the square root of 9 plus 2 is 11, carry the 1. 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 1 is 6. 61 over 6. Now, before I do anything else, I know that 3 goes into 61. I want to see if I have a perfect square. Probably not. 2 times 3 is 6, 6 minus 6 is 0, bring down the 1, no, 
that's going to be zero and remainder one, so 20 and one third, 20 and one third. Why did I divide three? Ah, yes, but three does go in. No, it doesn't. Silly goose. Never mind. You didn't see me do that. Anyway, I just found out. Yeah, I 61. No, mm -mm. we're going to leave it 61. So this actually, this, these actually are the answers. Negative seven plus or minus the square root of 61 over six. So my answer is going to be B. Now, if you had not put parentheses around the negative seven, you would have had negative 49 plus 12. There would have been a negative answer under there and you would have had an I in front, so you would have chosen C. So, just be careful. Ah, it's positive seven. Positive seven. Goodness. Okay, partial credit for that. A is the answer. Because negative negative is a positive, you've got positive seven. Okay, that was number 16. Seven plus or minus the square root of 61 over six. Let's do this one. Five X squared plus 15 equals zero. You do not have an X term here. You can pull out a common factor if you want. Five times X squared plus three equals zero and then divide both sides by five. That would actually be a good way to start if you're going into this kind of cold. A zero divided by five is zero, so now you've got x squared plus three equals zero. Ah, what are you gonna do here? Well, subtract three from both sides. And what that's going to do is give you x squared equals negative three. So when you take the square root of both sides so that you can solve for x, you are going to have to move over your equal sign. Plus or minus. There's a negative under the radical. So you have been drop kicked into the complex number system. So you're going to have X equals plus or minus the square root of negative one times three. So you are going to have X equals, no, don't do that. x equals plus or minus the square root of negative one times the square root of three, which is x equals plus or minus i times the square root of three, which is a perfectly good answer, unless they say to put it, to put a, uh, complex numbers in A plus BI form, which they don't say. So you can leave the answers like that. You can say I times the square root of three, negative I times the square root of three. And if there's a plus or minus sign there in the toolbar, you can even say plus or minus I 
times the square root of three. If for some weird reason my math lab counts it wrong, I would count it right and you would get 100% on that question. Okay. Well, we have come to the end of our time together. Imagine that. Okay, it's on to the test, but I'm going to show up here tomorrow anyway to continue being the answer lady. I would recommend you all continue working on uh, the practice exam, and if you run into problems you don't understand how to do, drop me an email or come by tomorrow during class time and ask, and we'll work on it then.